once again, despite my be the best efforts, my picture is crooked, which from what I understand, my tie is too, so maybe it'll uh, all work out. That's a little better. Uh, still ugly, but there's nothing I can do about that. First Peter. First Peter. Chapter 2. I'm going to have a very short text and a very long passage to preach on. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3, or 13 rather, verse 13, says, Submit yourselves. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much you've allowed us to be in your house we thank you for your blessings we thank you for the day we thank you for the fact as we just sang jesus loves even us we just ask that you'd help us to be true to your word open our hearts open our minds uh, open everything about us to the preaching of your word just enable me to preach at this time help me to preach truth help me to uh, well present the word of god Forgive me of my sins and enable me to do this great task. Draw your people to you at this time. All these things we ask in Jesus' precious name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Submission is the topic tonight. Submission. Spurgeon said to risk all with Jesus is to end all risk. And to do that, we have to be willing to submit. Now, we think, okay, well, we're willing to submit to Jesus, are we not? Amen. And, uh, you know, we, we will say things, and, and Peter himself at one point said, you know, it, uh, though everyone else deny you, though everyone else forsake you, if they turn their back on you, no matter what anyone else does, I will follow you. I won't do it. And as much as we desire to submit to Jesus, Peter here shares with us in chapter 2 and chapter 3 the importance of submission not just to Jesus, but to all those things that he, the Lord, has put over us to be submissive to. Now, in my study, and I've, I've noticed three main themes. There may be more, more themes that I, I have not picked up on in 1 Peter. Now, the, what we've preached here in the last few weeks, I believe we could put that under sanctification or separation, uh, the first chapter and a half. And uh, he, he, by the way, the, the, uh, these these. Um, themes are, are intermixed throughout the book, uh, throughout the epistle, uh, but yet it seems that that first part talks about separation and sanctification. This middle part that we're going to look at tonight talks about submission, what we need to submit to. Yes, we all know we need to submit to the Lord, but he gives us uh, four things here in the area of submission that we need to be obedient to. Also in there, and then once again mingled, mingled in here, but uh, specifically toward the end, I believe he talks about suffering as well. The Bible doesn't say that we may suffer. The Bible says that we will suffer. Peter here in this epistle says, don't think it's something strange when you suffer. He was talking to a suffering people. These people knew suffering. These people were holding on with hope, just as we are today, looking for the coming of Christ. But as I said, what I'd like to look at today is submission, and we probably won't be able to go very deep into one section because this covers a whole uh, expansive uh, uh, half of chapter 2 
all of chapter 3. And uh, so we're going to, to just broadly uh, look over it and trust the Lord to help us to hit on some high notes. The first thing he talks about is submission to man-made ordinances. We all think we do that. We're good citizens, are we not? We obey the law, we do, we do what, and, and yet, uh, more and more I see, profess, I see preachers that are hesitant and even bold to say, well, I'm not going to follow what the law has said for us to do. It says there in um, verse 13, and I don't have this really planned out as, as far as I'm going to read here, but submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or to unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And, and I will say this, that the, a lot of the things that I'm uh, uh, talking about, we talked about how people were offended by uh, the preaching of Jesus there when he went home to Nazareth and how the, the very people that he, he grew up with were sought to throw him off a cliff. And uh, when we get into the submission topic, when we get go further than saying, okay, we need to submit to the Lord, when we talk about submitting to the laws and submitting, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and give you my point. Submitting to our master, submission in marriage, uh, submission in all manner of things. Uh, people get angry. People get angry. Usually when people get angry, it's, it's, it's because they're not doing what the Bible says. We looked at that this morning. And Peter is not alone in this. You say, well, this is just something Peter came up with. Paul in Romans 13 is saying the same thing. Paul and Peter, and Peter are in agreement with this, and they're in, in agreement because they're both being led by the Holy Spirit. Now, we are to submit to the laws of the land. We are to submit to, to what our, our government and our governors and, and those that have rulership over us um, would have us to do as long as what they are telling us to do is number one legal by our own laws sometimes we get uh, uh, our our, uh, our leaders and our, our supreme courts tell us to do things that are contrary to the word of God Amen. and contrary to the constitution um, but let's use for an example Daniel Daniel was uh, God's man under several different kings. Heathen kings, by the way, uh, you know, we think uh, uh, sometimes our, our, our government can be obtrusive here. What kind of government was Peter and Paul living at under when, when they wrote these things down? You know, what we want to say is, oh, it was different for Paul. It was different for Peter. It was different. There's nothing different about us and the people in the Bible. The scripture clearly teaches that God has put those people in that position. Now, in America, we have something that they didn't have back then. We have the right to vote these people in and to vote them out. I think we've made some poor choices lately, but yet, We do have that freedom. But Daniel, he was submissive to the law as long as it did not hinder his walk with the Lord. You know, our, 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 if our government for, uh, forbids us from meeting together, and the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of ourselves together, who should we follow? But if it's not contrary to the word of God, we are to obey the word of God. The Hebrew midwives. You remember when, when Pharaoh said, you know, throw, uh, kill every, every, every uh, boy that comes out of the womb? They said, well, no, we're not going to do that. God has told us, thou shalt not kill. 
Wish we had a few of those midwives to, uh, around today because we're, we're slaughtering our, our, our innocent babies in the womb. And even, even uh, uh, now there's a push, and there's been a push for years, to even newborns. But we are to follow the law as long as it is not contrary to the word of the Lord. Let's look at Romans chapter 13. I think Paul expounds upon it a little bit more than, than Peter does. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that or that be ordained of God. And by the way, you know, ever since we've been here, we've always had our president on the prayer list. We've always prayed for our president. Haven't always liked our president. Haven't always liked that person who was our president. And yet, we need to pray for these people. Look what God did with Nebuchadnezzar. If God can change Nebuchadnezzar, God can change the hearts of even our most wicked of leaders. Whosoever resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall be received to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be a, a afraid of the power? Now once again, who was, who was in power? Caesar was in power. As a matter of fact, the, the, the same uh, rulers put Peter and Paul to death. And yet they said, we need to obey these rulers. And God has a, a reason for the things that they do. Um, let, let, me, let me add this before I go on and, and, and reading the scripture there. Uh, who here thinks that Hitler was a, a good leader? A good, uh, and, and by the way, Fuhrer means leader. Nobody's in the Hitler camp here today. Yet God put him in that position, and the outcome became that nations decided Israel needed their own homeland. So as horrible as everything that Hitler did was, God was going to use that eventually for good. We need to remember that. Putin right now. God's just sitting rush up for their own destruction. We need to remember that. He said, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. Now, now Daniel helped his, his rulers. He helped his, his leaders. He advised them very well. But Daniel also stood and didn't compromise the word of God. For he is the minister of God to, to thee to, for good. But, that, but if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, the revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Therefore thus must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for consciousness' sake. For this cause pay ye tribute, for they are God's ministers att uh, attending, uh, attending continually upon this very things. And it goes on, render therefore to them all their dues and tribute to where tribute is due. And Jesus said, uh, you know, uh, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, unto God which is God. Custom is to custom, fear to whom is fear, honor to whom is honor. So both Paul and Peter agree that we are to obey the man-made ordinance. Obey the law as long as it doesn't conflict with the real law. 
probably most of us here, I would say, and, and I would be shocked if anyone uh, feels contrary. We're against abortion, are we not? I, I just talked about baby murder uh, uh, a little while ago. Didn't see anybody getting mad that I was uh, uh, speaking up against abortion. Yet, is it right for us as Christians to bomb abortion claims? No. Once again, we have the, the legal ability to vote for leaders. And, and too many times we, we vote for what we think is going to benefit us and benefit our pocketbooks. That's how these corrupt people have gotten into office. These wicked people have gotten into office. We are to obey the man-made ordinance because it is the command of God. God has told us to do it. It is the conduit of God. God is using even the most wicked leaders for our good. And when we pay our taxes, it is our contribution to God's work. So it talks about submission to, to man-made ordinance. It also talks about submission to masters. Look at, look, let's look at verse 18. Is a servant to be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the, the good and gentle, but also to the froward? For this is thankworthy for a man, if a man for good conscience toward God Endure grief, suffering will, uh, wrongfully. For it, what glory is it if you be buffeted for your faults? You shall take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, it is acceptable with God. Then it gives us the example of, how, uh, of once again, this is going to intermingle suffering. For hereunto we are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps, who did no sin, neither guile was found, uh, was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, and when he suffered, threatened not, and uh, committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Now he's not talking about uh, a pilot here, he's talking about he committed himself to the Father. He committed himself to God. He's the one who judges right, righteously. Who was in his own self, uh, who in his own self bear our sins in his own body of, uh, of the tree, that we, might, uh, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness, whose, by whose stripes you are healed. And ye were as sheep gone astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Submission to our masters. Now, we don't have masters like they had in uh, the, the Bible days where, where they were, uh, there were slaves and there were masters. Uh, but we do have bosses. We do have those that have certain authority over us. And as we use the example of Daniel and the Hebrew midwives, let us look at, at Joseph. Joseph wasn't always treated well by his masters, was he? He, he wasn't uh, always, uh, but rather than speak up against them, rather than uh, revolt against them, he just let God handle it. He just let God handle it. And in, in the end, Joseph was raised up. Now, we may not see that in our day, but uh, God is going to bless us. Problem is, we shouldn't be depending on our bosses and our jobs for our blessings. Our blessings come from God. Amen. And bosses may misuse us, and surely they're going to do what's best for the company and best for themselves. Unless you've got a good Christian boss. But ultimately, our blessings come from God. Now, when we submit to our masters and we behave a certain way and when we're uh, oppressed by our bosses and mistreated, when we don't act like the rest of the, the, the employees, when we don't act like the, the rest of our co-workers, and uh, when we still maintain our testimony, we deliver a good testimony. 
How many times have you heard the testimony that somebody said, uh, you know, uh, there was a guy at work, there was a woman at work, and no matter what happened, they still were different. They still had a joy about them. They still had a peace about them. They, they, they still had a, a, a good attitude, a good spirit. Maybe not necessarily about the work, maybe not necessarily about the boss, but there was something different about that person. And that caused that coworker to try to figure out what's that all about. And by the way, in this, and probably under under submission in marriage, uh, we have the best example. But God has has put up, you know. Man-made authorities. God has put up the bosses and things like that. God in the home has put up people in authority. And what happens not only out in the workplace and out in the world when, when your friends and your neighbors and your co-workers look at you and they, they see, okay, there's something different about them because they're handling this a lot better than I would have. Our children are also watching. We live in a society where the husband being the head of the household is scoffed at, laughed at, made fun of. Uh, to, it's, it's obsolete. It's old-fashioned. And the children don't learn uh, 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 to be submissive to authority. And when wives don't uh, honor their husbands and are not in submission to their husbands... Then the children look at that and, and, and they have no uh, uh, um, respect for authority. When the kid misbehaves in school or gets in trouble with the police and the parents don't respect that authority, the kids learn not to respect that authority. And then we wonder why we're in the situation we're in. So let's move on. Submission in marriage. And by the way, their, their submission in marriage, we're going to see is a two-way street. Many times it's preached, you know, wives, uh, submit to your husbands. Wives, submit to your husbands. And, and uh, they don't see that there is a mutual relationship there. It's not preached in that way. Now, we, we gave you the, as we said, we gave you an example of, of Daniel as uh, submitting to man-made ordinances and, and Joseph submitting to his masters. But Peter himself gives us our example here when it talks about wives submitting to their husbands. He gives us the example of Sarah. Likewise, you wives, verse of chapter 3, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, may without the word be won by the conversion of the wives. Well, they behold your chaste conversation, and we've already said that when Peter, uh, the translator, uh, here in First Peter uses that word conversation. He's talking about our conduct. Conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning let it not be an outward adorning of the plating of hair or the, or the wearing of gold or of the putting on of apparel. But let it be of the hidden man and of the heart and that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is the sight of of God, uh, of God, of great price. After this manner, in old time, holy women also, who trusted in God, adorned uh, themselves, being uh, in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Whose daughters you are, as as long as you do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. 
Now, years ago, I, I, I heard uh, Tony Evans said, okay, women, go look at your husband and, and just call him Lord right now. And uh, I've tried that, and uh, you know, the women are always reluctant to do it. They're always reluctant to do it. But the scripture says that, that God has put the husband in that position, and we'll see why, and we'll see the responsibility of the husband in that position. He gives the example of Sarah. Now, Sarah followed Abraham. She was obedient to Abraham, and God blessed Sarah. God blessed that household. As a matter of fact, the, the, the times when uh, uh, it seemed that Abraham just kind of followed after what Sarah told him to do, that turned out not too good, did it? Not, with, not that women should not advise their husbands, and give them their input and give them, but make sure it's godly influence. Make sure it's, it, it, it's uh, the will of God. Sarah knew the will of God, but yet she told Abraham to do something contrary to the will of God. But you want God to bless your household. You want your God to, 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 to bless your marriage. Uh, be in submission to your husbands. It says that the, the, the lost men may be converted. By the conduct of the women. Now there's a, a part here that, that people misunderstand sometimes. When it talks about let your, let, uh, uh, that your adorning shouldn't be with the plating of the hair or, or, or the wearing of gold or the putting on of apparel. And, and, and some people teach and preach, well women shouldn't fix themselves up. They shouldn't fix their hair up. They shouldn't uh, somebody asked uh, Carl Morton, I don't know if this is original with him, and he said, is it a sin for women to wear makeup? And he said, it's a sin for some women not to wear makeup. He said, any old barn will look good with a coat of paint on it. It's not saying look haggardly. It's saying let that not be your true beauty. Your beauty should be within Yes, I believe that men and women should try to be appealing to each other. That they should uh, uh, try to look well for each other. Not for the world. It's funny how, how uh, people will dress up uh, wanting the world to look at them and, and see how good they are. But, that, you know, they, they come home to each other and they're, they, they just let themselves go. But he said, let your beauty be inner beauty. That you might be a blessing to your husband. And husbands, by the way, you know, keep yourselves up for your wives. No woman wants an old stinky man. He said, uh, Carl Morton pointed this out. I've heard him uh, talk about this a couple of times. He said, people say, uh, don't, don't, let, don't let your adorning be the, the plating or the, the fixing up of your hair. He said, well, the, you shouldn't fix up, people say you shouldn't fix up your hair or the, or the wearing of gold. That means women shouldn't wear jewelry. They shouldn't wear uh, 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 fancy things. They shouldn't wear uh, what they said in the, called in the 90s, bling. So you shouldn't fix up your hair and you, you shouldn't wear gold and according to the last part of there, you shouldn't put on any apparel. That's not what the scripture's saying. All he's saying is more important to be beautiful and to let your husband feel loved and respected than any of these other things. Now, husbands, we got any husbands out there? It says, likewise, ye husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessels, as of being heirs toward the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. You'll notice that very first word, verse 7, likewise. It's saying, women, submit to your husbands 
husbands submit to your wives? How does a husband submit to their wife? Well, Ephesians chapter 5, and I don't guess, oh yeah, 525 says submitting yourselves one to another. Uh, it says in 521, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, how do you submit to your wives? By, by sacrificing for their good. For giving up sometimes the things that you want for their good. For, for being willing to lay down your very life for them. To sacrifice your, your, your time and your hard work that they might have a better life. And that doesn't mean what... Uh, uh, my former pastor said that the most trouble he ever got into and the worst gift he ever gave, he gave his wife a waffle iron for, I think it was for Christmas. So she didn't even like waffles. So he's thinking, I'm going to help her out. So I'm going to get her a waffle iron so it'll be easier for her to make me waffles. Uh, I don't think the wife is feeling too submissive to him at that point. If the wives know that you're doing everything for their own good, they're willing to submit and give what they have that your marriage would be a better marriage. And by the way, these things, if the Bible tells it, you know, this, this is not just good advice. This is not just advice that we might have better lives and better marriages and things like that. If the Bible says to do these things and we don't do them, it's a sin. Finally, submission from malicious behavior. Now, early on, as we said, as we preached out of the first chapter and a half of this, we talked about how our behavior should be, how we should conduct ourselves, how we should be separate, how the world is watching us and our testimony before the world uh, 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 is made by how we live and how we endure and, and, and the things that we not only do, but the things that we abstain from. And he goes on to talk about that somewhat again. Submission from malicious behavior. Chapter 3, verse 9. Not rendering evil for evil, railing for railing, or contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are unto call that ye should inherit a blessing. Uh, the scripture says, I believe it's in Hebrews, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Once again, you're ruining your testimony. You're ruining your life, as a matter of fact. You're making yourself miserable when, when, when you're wanting to, uh, when you're consumed with trying to get even with people. And once again, all these things the world is watching, we'll see later on that especially even the world wasn't watching, God is watching. But when we let that root of bitterness dwell inside of us and grow inside of us we're hurting ourselves more than we're hurting anyone else when we get obsessed with getting even we're hurting ourselves we're hurting not only our testimony we're hurting our joy we're hurting our happiness it speaks about vengeance it speaks in verse 10 about vocalized evil For he that will love life, see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips, that they speak no guile. Now, Brother Holt has been preaching through the book of James on Sunday mornings, and uh, those, those sermons are available, uh, if you care. But, but you know, James speaks a lot about controlling the tongue. Controlling the tongue. If we can't control our tongue, our religion is vain. Everything else that we profess is vain. So don't use our tongues for evil. What is that? that that's gossip. That's lying. That's hateful speech.
He says, if you love life and you want to see good days, watch your mouth. Once again, I think it was Carl Morton who talked about a woman that came forward and said, uh, told the preacher at the end of the service, I want to lay my tongue on the altar. And he said, I don't think it's long enough. We should, should <laughs> how about you laugh like just after like long delay. Uh, anyway, submission to a victorious life. Let him eschew evil and, and do that which is good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. Now, Peter, throughout, throughout this epistle, keeps reminding these Christians to live a virtuous life. So much of our blessing depends on living a virtuous life and so much of being a blessing to others. And finally, the vision of the Lord, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his, his ears are open under their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, when I was speaking of husbands, I meant to mention this, and I, uh, I guess I passed it up. That verse in verse 7 that talks about husbands... Uh, uh, how the husband should treat their wives as honor as a weaker vessel, how you should put their needs before your own, how you should be willing to lay down your life. What does it say? That your prayers be not hindered. We talked this morning about how people's prayers are hindered, and there are certain things that, that, that are, you know, God has put the man in this position. And if he doesn't live up to those things, God's not going to hear his prayer. So we get down to verse 12 and it's talking about all these things as God is watching and his ears are open under their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. We should live submission, submissive lives. To submissive to each other. I believe that we as Christians need to be submissive to each other. Uh, submissive to the authorities, so submissive to the laws, understanding that all these things come from God. Even your spouse comes from God. And God is watching. And God blesses those who obey these things. And God hears the prayers of those that obey these things. Nobody wants to hear sermons based on submission. People get angry. But they all want the blessings of God. Blessed are they that hear these things and do them. Would you stand?